Welcome again to Grand Rounds. Today's Grand Rounds is one of our crossroads in psychiatry. And to remind you, this series, we have two of these every year. And this series really is meant to bring together our research community and our clinical community. And so um, today's presentation is going to follow a similar format to the other crossroads that we've done. Um, we will have one presentation from Dr. Courtney Beard, who's going to present some of her research on anxiety. And then we will hear from uh, Dr. Kate McHugh, um, who's going to give some clinical commentary um, and how this might apply to clinicians. Not that Dr. Beard can't do some of that. So, <clears throat> so there's definitely some overlap. But let me tell you about these two people, in case you don't know them. So Dr. Courtney Beard is a clinical psychologist with expertise in anxiety disorders, cognitive biases, cognitive behavioral therapy, and treatment outcome research. She's assistant director in the clinical research program here at McLean Hospital's behavioral health partial program and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Her research aims to delineate cognitive mechanisms underlying emotional disorders and to develop treatments that target these mechanisms. She's internationally known for her work on cognitive bias modification. She's a past recipient of an NIH F32 postdoctoral fellowship grant in which she tested a cognitive bias modification computerized treatment for social anxiety disorder. Her current NIMH funded R34 project aims to develop a transdiagnostic, personalized, online cognitive bias modification treatment for anxiety disorders as well as the methods for primary care practices to prescribe and deliver this treatment. And Dr. Kate McHugh, who you'll be hearing from after that presentation, Dr. McHugh received her bachelor's in psychology from Harvard College, her PhD in clinical psychology from Boston University, and she's currently a clinical psychologist in the Division of Alcohol and Drug Abuse here at McLean Hospital and also an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She's a clinical researcher and practitioner whose work focuses on the nature and treatment of anxiety and substance use disorders. She's the recipient of awards from the American Psychological Association, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and the College of Problems on Drug Dependence. And her research is currently funded by grants from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. She also specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy for the treatment of anxiety, depressive, and substance use disorders. So again, first we'll hear from Dr. Beard. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Courtney Beard. Hello. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm particularly excited that I get to do this today with one of my favorite people here at McLean, Kate McHugh. Let's see. First, I'd like just to acknowledge some of the collaborators on the work that I'll be presenting today, as well as my funding from NIMH. So this figure presents the treatment development process, specifically for psychosocial treatments. It also happens to reflect the progression of my own program of research since graduate school. So I thought what I would do today is just walk us through what this process looks like for one particular intervention target called interpretation bias. Can everyone hear me? OK, good. Um, so I'll start by presenting some studies showing you how we actually look at this in the laboratory and measure someone's interpretation bias. Then we're going to translate those findings into a very specific intervention targeting that mechanism, showing that we can do this in the lab and having some good efficacy. But then I'm going to show you what I've been working on more recently. And that's this second phase of translation. So what happens when we take these treatments that work very well in the lab and sort of let them loose in the wild, in the real world? Are they still going to work? And how do we need to alter them to best implement them? And I'll be showing you a couple examples of how I'm doing that um, today. So I'm sure almost everyone in this room is familiar with interpretation bias, even if you don't call it that. It simply refers to the tendency that some people have to jump to negative conclusions. So when they encounter ambiguity in their lives, which is happening all the time, their brains more easily access a negative or threatening interpretation of that compared to someone who doesn't have this bias. Um, so we see this clinically all the time, and we um, 
We target this in treatment all the time already, but I still think it's a good idea to go through a few examples so you see what I'm talking about. And I do this also just to illustrate and get us thinking of just how often this is happening throughout the day and we're not even aware of it. So how often we're encountering, encountering ambiguity and our brains are resolving it for us very efficiently so we can go about our days um, and we're, we're not even aware of it. So here's a few examples of what I'm talking about. So let's say you email your friend and they haven't replied yet. That's very ambiguous. Some people's brains are going to very quickly access a, a benign interpretation of that while others might think their friend's upset with them or mad. Something like this, I'm sure one of you is going to yawn at any point now, and I'm going to see it. <laughs> And depending on how I interpret that, I could get much more anxious right now. This one, I'm sure any of the parents in the crowd of young children know that this winter has been off to a really rocky start. My children have been sick literally for the past month with all sorts of things, including really random things. So my son Joey is complaining that his calf is hurting. Um, so I'm sure most parents would think nothing of that or really you know, assume it's something benign. But someone who has this vulnerability to have an interpretation bias, their brains might jump to something like a blood clot, for example. And then finally, <laughs> this is something that happens to me all the time. I have a very ambiguous looking boss and <laughs> And he's right there if you want to see for yourself. Um, and he actually looks like this in real life. So when we're, when, we're, when we're meeting, you know, across the office, he's looking at me like this. And sometimes he's speaking Icelandic on top of it. So, you know, I'm already having to interpret that. But then what also happens a lot is he'll swing by my office and ask to meet with me later on in the day and not say why. So again, what my brain quickly jumps to is going to really affect how I feel the rest of the day and my behavior. And again, you know, we're in this vicious cycle that we all are well aware of. Um, so I hope, you know, just these few examples have gotten you thinking of, of just how often we're interpreting ambiguity in our daily lives. And again, it's this very quick process that we're not aware of, and that makes us very efficient. Um, but where does this come from? You know, what causes one person to jump to the negative conclusions while another to the positive? I'm actually not going to talk to you about that at all today because <laughs> there's virtually no research on it to speak of. Um, people assume that it's like anything, that there's, you know, genetic vulnerability and learning experiences and all of that stuff. But no one's really looked at this specifically for interpretation bias. Um, but I will quickly present one study that speaks to this issue a little bit um, in terms of the genetics. And I just thought this was really cool that people are trying to develop animal models for a cognitive bias. Um, so in this study, they took a group of mice and they trained them that if they went to the right in this apparatus, that was a positive outcome. So they would gain access to their home cage where they feel comfortable. And if they went to the left, that was a negative outcome, and they would get an aversive air puff. And once they learned this contingency, then they tested them by closing off the side arms and just having the central arm available, which is inherently ambiguous. And they measured how long it took them to get to that central hole. And what's really interesting is when they looked at the response latencies, depending on the mouse genetics, you can see in that red bar there, that's the allele of the serotonin transporter gene that's been linked to anxiety and depression. Um, so pretty, pretty interesting. But I'm going to shift to humans now because that's what I know. Um, and I'm not going to go through this whole model, but I just want to point out the places where interpretation bias plays a role. So this is a really common, um, old now model of social anxiety disorder. And in this model, you have some type of triggering situation, which is going to have lots of ambiguity in it, of course. And we immediately start making interpretations of that and start to assign a meaning to that situation. And so that's what 
we refer to as your online interpretation. So how your brain is resolving this thing the moment you're encountering it. And this is the place where we're doing it hundreds of times a day. But interpretation also plays a role after the fact when you're remembering the event. So if you see that yellow box there of post-event processing, each time we recall the, the situation during that memory retrieval, we're continuing to reinterpret it. And this is what, um, you know, as clinicians, we're used to doing, helping people with their post hoc appraisals of something. So we refer to that as your offline interpretation of something. So there's models that are similar to this, you know, for other anxiety disorders and depression as well. Um, this is just to show you an example. And so since these have been proposed, Researchers have been trying to figure out, well, how do we measure these processes in the lab? You saw how you might do it with a mouse. Um, I'm going to show you the ways people have tried to do it with uh, humans. So a lot of people have used things like this, where you give someone an ambiguous situation. So you have to give a speech, you stand up behind the podium partway through, people think your presentation is, and it's completely ambiguous until that final word, which could resolve it in a positive or a negative way. And so you don't ask people to actually interpret this. You, we're going to try to get at it in a more implicit, indirect way. So instead, you ask them to make some type of decision about that final word. Is it a grammatically possible ending? Or is it a real word or not a real word? And then we measure their reaction time and compare the reaction time to make those decisions for positive versus uh, negative endings. <clears throat> and so that's an index of how their brains were already interpreting that passage when they get to it. There have been a couple of studies that have used that same task now and also collected EEG while people read those passages. Um, and in this study, for example, people with social phobia and with depression had larger N4 potentials when they read those positive outcomes compared to healthy controls. And so the author suggested that this means the people, the clinical samples uh, were really, it was an unexpected ending when they came to that positive resolution. It was more of a surprise compared to the healthy controls who were sort of already interpreting it in this positive way. So we have lots of data now showing that clinical samples lack this positive bias that healthy controls have. And there was actually a, a recent review just last year by Colette Hirsch that summarized all the literature on interpretation bias to date. Um, and so, you know, across all these studies, they've shown that, yes, interpretation bias plays a causal maintaining role across emotional disorders. It also combines with other processes like attention and memory. And we should obviously then target this in our treatment. And they make the distinction in this review um, that I made earlier that we need to think about measuring and intervening on this at the online stage of processing. <clears throat> so this review included you know, a lot of studies. I can't remember how many right now. But um, most of the samples in those studies are fairly homogenous. So it might be people with social anxiety disorder or people with panic disorder, for example. Um, so when I came to McLean a few years ago, I was curious to see if this mechanism I've been studying in the lab with homogenous samples um, was still relevant or meaningful. So I wanted to test this in the patients we see at the Behavioral Health Partial Hospital. So for those of you who aren't familiar with our program, the BHP serves as a bridge between inpatient and outpatient treatment. Um, we treat over 800 people a year. It's adults with primarily mood, anxiety, personality, and psychotic disorders. Um, they're with us for a very short amount of time, usually like three to 10 days. And during that time, they get really intensive training in CBT and DBT skills, and also case management and medication management. Um, and uh, so our patients are very uh, clinically diverse, so lots of comorbidity, all different um, diagnoses, and also lots of acute stressors and crises and suicidal ideation. So the first thing I just wanted to see was what does interpretation bias look like in a sample like this? And does it predict anything important like how people do in our treatment? So I gave some of our patients an assessment of their interpretation bias. And the first thing that was really interesting was that 
um, their scores on this were fairly normally distributed. So this means that some of our patients were endorsing all the positive interpretations, looking like a healthy control, a lot in the middle, and then some more on the other extreme who were not endorsing many positive interpretations at all, and those are typically the people we would say have a bias. So this suggests to me that interpretation bias may be a really important mechanism for some of our patients, but not others, and it, it might be a unique risk factor for some things in this transdiagnostic sample. Let's see. Oh, oh and one other thing I wanted to mention is that this is something that uh, we really haven't looked at before because all of those other studies in the review are comparing a healthy group to a clinical group. No one's looking within the clinical group to see does this matter. So the next thing I looked at was does your interpretation bias when you start treatment matter at all in terms of your treatment outcomes? And I'll just present you one of the findings from this study that was really striking. Um, so interpretation bias at baseline predicted how much residual suicidal ideation you had when you discharged, controlling for your baseline levels of suicidal ideation. So you can see my group that has a bias, they're not interpreting things positively, has more suicidal ideation. <clears throat> this was really a striking finding for a couple different reasons. So first is, in addition to interpretation, I looked at a whole bunch of other potential predictors of suicidal ideation. I looked at people's demographic background, their clinical characteristics like baseline symptom severity, number of prior hospitalizations. None of those things predicted it, but interpretation did. Um, so, you know, that makes me think of some of Matt Knox's work that you may have uh, seen where these more implicit measures could possibly be better predictors of suicidal um, outcomes than what we have to rely on currently, which is just asking people and other things like that. Um, and this was particularly interesting to me because this assessment of their interpretation had nothing to do with suicide. These were just like daily situations, like the ones I showed you, but it's showing this specific link. Um, and since I published this finding, I've looked at this again in a second cohort of people, and it's still there, it stayed the same. So I'm starting to actually believe it now. I'm getting a little more confidence in it. I'm quite skeptical of my own work, actually. Um, okay. So we've identified this mechanism that's important across emotional disorders. Now we want to know well, what's, what's the best way to target this in a treatment. So first I'd like to take a moment and talk about how we already do this. We've been doing this for decades in therapy, you know, most notably in cognitive therapy. But let's take a minute and think about how this actually works. So our clients are out in the real uh, world, in their daily lives. Their brains are resolving ambiguity hundreds of times a day without them even being aware of it. Then they come into our office. We pick one of those interpretations that they've made and we've thoroughly evaluated it, sometimes for a long time. Like you might take 30 minutes helping this person really um, question that interpretation, and then if you're lucky by the end of it, you've come up with some sort of alternative resolution or interpretation of that situation. And this can be very effective. We know that it's effective. Um, but it sure seems like it might be an inefficient way to do this, just getting one interpretation out of all those that they're making. Um, and that it may take a lot of time for that to actually generalize to people's online interpretations. It also seems like this could be particularly difficult for people who um, don't have the cognitive resources to do this introspective and kind of laborious work, sort of like the people we see at the BHP, who their symptoms are very acute, they have a lot of stressors and things like that. Uh, and, and finally, because of the you know, the fact that this just takes a long time, it's maybe not going to be suitable for really brief treatment settings like we have at the BHP. And we actually have some data to speak to this. In our own um, patients, we found that their reported use of cognitive skills was not related at all to their overall improvement, whereas other things were, like behavioral skills. And again, that's not surprising because there's just not enough time for them to really learn this and start to apply it. Um, so, 
we need to come up with some additional ways of, of getting at this that could either be used complementary with this offline process and get the online and the offline going together, um, or maybe instead of for some people who have difficulty doing this. So that's where CBM comes in. Cognitive bias modification just refers to a methodology, really, where you take a computerized training task with, that has lots of repetition um, that's designed to shift someone's cognitive biases. Could be interpretation, it could be something else. In the case of interpretation, you develop a task that encourages someone to repeatedly interpret things in a positive way and to try to do this in a more implicit, automatic, online way. Um, let's see. So, um, well, I'll just say the, the spoiler alert is that this obviously hasn't come true because you're all still here. Um, and your job is not in danger at all. As you'll see, this is a very, very simple, low intensity intervention that's just targeting one specific mechanism. Um, and that's really cool because we can, you know, study it in the lab and know exactly what we're doing. Um, but it's certainly not going to put anyone out of the business. And actually, I think perhaps the best use of this is going to be complementing existing treatment, giving us another tool in our toolbox. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, so I developed something called the word sentence association paradigm, or what's up? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> In this, a word flashes very quickly, so you would see embarrassing, you know, for half a second. And then you'd see this ambiguous situation, people laugh after something you said. Your job is to decide, is the word related to the sentence? If you say yes to this, immediately the computer is going to tell you you're incorrect. But if you see this one, funny, people laugh after something you said, and if you say yes, I think those things are related, then you're going to be told you're correct. So it's very simple, it's very straightforward, it's just trying to get people to very quickly and habitually jump to a positive conclusion, like a healthy uh, adaptive interpretation style is. So I developed this task and I first piloted it in a group of undergraduates who were high on social anxiety. Um, so I gave them, you know, hundreds of these trials, but it only takes 10 minutes to do. And I gave them eight sessions of this 10-minute computer treatment. <clears throat> and I saw really promising effects. It was able to shift their interpretation in the way that I wanted. And additionally, how much their interpretation change predicted how much their social anxiety changed. So it did mediate changes in their anxiety outcomes. So that was exciting. I thought I should pilot this some more in a clinical sample of people with diagnosed social anxiety disorder. So I gave them the same thing. Eight sessions of this 10-minute simple task, so that's like 80 minutes total of the intervention, no clinician contact, and I see the same thing. So my CBM group in the red, you can see, is showing this nice gradual reduction in their symptoms. And by the end of treatment, they're below the clinical cut point for the Leibowitz anxiety scale of, of a 60. And that's compared to my placebo group who did a sham type of training. And what's even better is I see the same effects on a behavioral measure of social anxiety. So I asked my participants to give an impromptu speech. I video recorded it. And then I had research assistants who didn't know what condition they were in rate the quality of their speech and how anxious the person looked. And you can see at pre, before treatment, the groups are the same. But after treatment, the CBM group is giving better speeches. And this effect size is, is large and is actually in line with some of the existing treatments we have for social anxiety, just from this you know, simple little computer task. So this was really remarkable, but a very small sample. Um, but it's since been replicated in other labs. So we actually have some de decent efficacy data for this specific task. However, I do not think that something is, you know, as, as low intensity as this is going to work for everyone. I think there's going to be certain people for whom this is particularly helpful for. So I did a little exploring in my data from this pilot trial, even though my sample size is not even close to allowing me to do this. Um, but what I found was interesting, that it only seemed to work for my younger participants, younger meaning 37 uh, or, or younger. 
So in that group, CBM was superior to placebo. In my older group, there was no effect. So I thought that was very interesting, but I didn't make too much of it at the time because this was such a, a small sample. But this recent mega analysis that just came out is showing the same exact effect of age. So in this study, they looked at studies of attention bias modification, so a related cognitive bias, a related intervention, um, and pooled together across all the existing studies and pooled together people's individual patient level data so that they could have a large enough sample size to look at some moderators like this. Um, and they're finding the same thing. So in that younger cohort, a, uh, CBM is superior to control, and actually in the older group, you're seeing the reverse, which is really interesting. Um, and we don't yet know why this is the, the case. I have a, several ideas. My current hunch is that it might have to do with the malleability of your bias, and that it might just be more malleable when you're younger, and that that's something we can actually test. Another really important finding that came out of this review was that if you did CBM in the laboratory when we have a lot of control and we know what's happening, we know what you're doing, then there's a, an effect. It's, it's better than control. But once you let it loose and just let people do it at home completely on their own, there's absolutely no effect of the treatment. Um, so this is really discouraging when you think about the potential of this type of intervention is, is so great because you can do it entirely on your own at home, but this is suggesting that, at least in its current form, that's, that's not going to be the way to go. So let's keep these things in mind as we progress through um, the last phase of this, which is taking these things into the real world. I'm going to show you two examples of how I've done that. <clears throat> two very different settings, first in the partial hospital program here, and then in primary care. So for my first study, we're going back to the BHP where I work, and I thought this type of intervention could be particularly beneficial um, in the BHP for some of the reasons I already mentioned. So it's a very brief program. People, although we teach cognitive skills, they really don't have time to learn them or practice them. Um, and I thought, you know, it, it might be cool if people could just do this 10-minute task during their lunch break and see if it improves their treatment outcomes at all. I know, you know, I knew already that I'd already shown that it was important um, for some people in our program. So see if we could change it. So I created a CBM intervention specifically for the BHP, and we called it Eye Change. Um, and it covered just daily situations like the ones I showed you, some related to like social anxiety things, but others related to failure experiences, more depression um, related. And so I wanted to know, first of all, is this feasible to do in our clinic? Will patients want to do it, and what do they think of it? So I enrolled 127 people in this pilot trial, and they were randomly assigned to the eye change or some type of control condition. And you can see I weighted it so that more people would get the, the eye change. Um, I thought that would be helpful in terms of recruitment. And as you can see, 98% of people completed all of their sessions, which is amazing. So this seemed to be very feasible. They were able to do this during their lunch hour. They had no problems with it. Um, and this was very naturalistic. So the number of sessions varied according to how many days people were with us. But on average, it was um, seven sessions. And I'd, I'll just take a moment here to brag about something that researchers never brag about. Um, I had no funding for this study. So there's no, there's no funding. And this is a decent sized pilot trial, 127 people with no funding. And that just speaks to the amazing place the BHP is. So first, our director, Thorster Bjorgensen, values integrating research and clinical care and has set up the infrastructure to be able to do things like this. Second, our clinical staff support these efforts and the students that work with us to get these done. And then, of course, our patients who are so generous to volunteer for these things without any compensation just to further science. So we're a pretty unique place that we can get a lot done without any money. 
All right, so it's very feasible, but what do people actually think about this? Because it's kind of a strange treatment to, to offer people. Um, and so some people said things like this, which I love. Uh, I think I might say something like that. <laughs> this is bogus. Um, but this really was the minority of people. It was much more common to see things like this. It seems simple, but made an impact on my perspectives. This person went on to say, I think it was helpful because it made me aware of how I'm reacting to situations. And I think that's exactly what it's doing. Um, even if it's not shifting their interpretation, this awareness piece keeps coming up in qualitative interviews. And you can imagine if you're sitting in front of a computer and in 10 minutes you've gone through hundreds of situations, you're gonna start to notice, oh, I'm like jumping to this negative conclusion a lot and this positive thing, that's not even entering my mind. So it really helps bring that awareness in a way that I think it takes us much longer to do in cognitive therapy. People also said things like it really helped solidify the program, so they felt like it complemented the CBT they were learning, which was um, nice, and I think that's gonna be a huge role for this type of intervention, is in augmenting CBT. <clears throat> And then people said, I can see how this can be applied to my everyday life, which is crucial because the last thing we want to happen is that people get really good at this simple task, but it doesn't actually generalize to their interpretations in their, their daily life. Okay, but does it work? So I thought that I would not be able to see any treatment effects at all yet with this pilot study. You know, it's a large sample, but still I knew I would need a much larger sample to see any additional effects above and beyond the very powerful treatment people are already getting at the BHP. People get a lot better. Um, and I'm going to brag again that I was right. So there's absolutely no effect of this when you look at the total <laughs> sample, and perhaps it is bogus. Um, but I also knew that this is probably not going to work for everyone, and I knew that there's some potential really important moderators. So I'm still in the middle of analyzing all this data. I'm just going to show you a couple of the really interesting things that are coming out of it so far having to do with age. So now you understand why when I look at the total sample there's nothing, because there are opposite things happening depending on your age. So let me just walk us through this very quickly. So this is showing you the percentage of people classified as a treatment responder to the BHP uh, according to their global improvement rating. And that green line there is our typical BHP response rate, which is not too shabby. And you can see in my younger group, if you got eye change, that's really bumping up your response rate, just this 10 minute task done at lunch. Whereas if you got the control, there's just nothing really happening. So that's remarkable. But what's even more interesting is in my older group, it's the exact opposite. So it seems like the control version of this is, is more helpful to my older participants. And I wish I had more time to discuss this with you today because this is fascinating to me and I have a lot of ideas about how my control condition is, is actually an active interpretation condition unintentionally. This is something that's been plaguing the field actually. Um, and so, there's some really interesting reasons why that might be more helpful with people who have had a bias for a longer amount of time compared to the one, compared to the eye change. Yeah? One idea I had is maybe another confounder is uh, prejudices and ideas. Like if you're looking at a computer. So I thought, you, so that was the first thing that came to mind, and it still could be that, because none of these studies that have included measures of computer anxiety or you know belief that a computer could help them. Um, so I want to look at that in addition to this issue of just how malleable is the bias. Um, okay, so this was really cool to see, and also I'm seeing it on another really important transdiagnostic outcome of well-being. So again, in my younger group, and, and younger in this again was 37 or younger, if you got eye change, you're reporting much more improvement in your well-being compared to the control. And in my older group, there doesn't seem to be anything going on. So this is pretty exciting, and actually now I would like some money, please. So um, 
I submitted a grant to try to really test this in our program and to develop it into a smartphone app so that we can offer it to many more patients at a time and also so that for people who, for whom the, do find it helpful, they can continue using it when they transition out of our program back to their daily life. Yes? I want to say we all know how practice affects everything. Yeah. Older people have more practice, i.e. time on doing it. They'll tell themselves so they have Exactly. So this predicts, if I'm right, this predicts a linear correlation. You've got a, 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 a to Z correlation. Uh, you don't have a linear, you don't, you don't have right. points in between. Right. No, I think I think that could be it exactly. But there's at the same time, so that that's the age part. But then there's also this issue of just your individual differences in malleability of the bias, which I think is related to age, but might be related to other things as well. Um, just how flexible it is in general. With yes, exactly. Exactly. No, I think I agree. Uh, okay. So I'm going to show you one more example then of how I'm trying to implement this in the real world, but in a very different setting, so in primary care. <clears throat> and this is a treatment development project that I'm doing in collaboration with my colleague, Risa Weisberg. And we thought primary care was the perfect place for this type of intervention for a couple reasons. Um, so first, I'm sure many of you know that primary care is where most people seek treatment for mental health problems. Um, people with anxiety disorders are particularly high utilizers of health care. And there's been a huge um, focus in primary care on screening for depression and treating depression, but not so much with anxiety. So there was sort of a gap we could fill there. And we thought, you know, this is a pretty quick thing that anyone could do. Maybe physicians could prescribe this to their, to their patients in a stepped care manner. Some people are going to benefit, and those that don't, they, they'll be monitored, and then they can be stepped up to other things. And this might be really nice for primary care practices that don't have behavioral health specialists on site and for people who don't want medication or who aren't responding enough to medication. But we knew we would have to develop this specifically for primary care. Um, so things like, we know primary care physicians are not making differential diagnoses between social anxiety and panic and G80. So the treatment needed to, to target all of those. Um, and we also knew we, we couldn't just have them prescribe this to people and then send them on their way. We knew it wasn't going to work just at home. So we created something called an anxiety specialist. This is just a lay person who meets weekly uh, with people and sets them up on the program, makes sure they're not having any problems, um, and sort of facilitates the generalization to their daily life as well. So we call our program Face Anxiety, and it's delivered on a website. And so when people log on, they first watch some videos of me explaining the treatment and the instructions. And then they do a number of questionnaires so that we can personalize the treatment. So for example, um, if you were married and were working, you would see situations related to those things. Similarly, it's, it's personalized to their anxiety symptoms. So this person um, gets anxious when their heart pounds and when they feel dizzy. So they're going to see situations related to that. And they're not going to see things related to choking or suffocation. So everyone gets a completely personalized intervention in this way. We also give people feedback after each session about how they're doing on the task. So this is an actual graph from one of our participants. And with each session, it's showing them that in red, their reaction time is going down, so they're getting faster at this. And in blue, their accuracy is going up, so they're, getting more, they're interpreting more and more things positively. But doing this in primary care has been much more challenging than doing it at the BHP, where people are already in treatment, and I'm just adding this on. Um, anyone who does clinical research knows that recruitment is always the hardest issue. Um, certainly is for us with this. You know, primary care providers, just they're, they, they're so busy, they're not going to remember to refer people. And then even when we have people who are interested, um, a lot of them have these trauma histories. And their primary issue is PTSD or some trauma-related thing. And the treatment in its current form is not going to address that. Then we have issues because the primary care practice that we're testing this in is a very large practice associated with Brown. Um, and it serves really, really low-income people who are struggling 
a lot of them don't have reliable transportation. And even when we get around that by offering for them to do some of the sessions at home, they can't because they don't have a computer or they don't have internet access. So a website seemed like a good idea years ago when we proposed this study, but now it's, it's very clear to me it needs to be on the phone eventually for this to work. And then people have lives, unfortunately, outside of the lab. So we've had participants who wanted to do it but ended up dropping out because they got mugged, they got evicted, their parents got sick, all these things. So it's just really important to keep in mind when you're developing a treatment that even something as low intensity as this, people have a hard time doing. But I'm going to end on some, some good news because I take my own programs here. Um, so we just, we finished our open trial of this in primary care, and at least for the people who were able to do it, it's, it's showing some good effects. So this is our primary outcome, the Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale. Um, you can see a lot of our patients are falling below the clinical cut point after treatment. <clears throat> We're about halfway through the randomized controlled trial now of this, so we'll see how this holds up in a larger group and compared to a control group. Um, but again, in our qualitative interviews, we're hearing good things like I can shop in Target now or I started talking to my neighbors. So people are able to identify some real behavioral changes which um, hopefully are due to the program. Um, so we're, we're encouraged that eventually this could, could work in primary care. So I'm just going to wrap up now quickly by saying that you know I showed you some very specific examples of CBM, mostly in anxiety disorders, um, but this truly is a transdiagnostic mechanism. So people are trying this type of thing with all sorts of populations, and it's really an exciting time in the field to see how creative we can be in developing a program much better than the one I have currently that could be more powerful and maybe power, powerful enough to shift these biases even in our older people, for example, um, or figuring out if we need a, a different version of the program for older people. Um, and really, it's just exciting to see how we can harness technology um, to improve outcomes for our patients. And I'm going to turn it over to Kate McHugh now, who's going to talk more about that and put this into a much broader context of, of using technology. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thanks to Courtney for a great start to this and for the uh, opportunity to be here. So I'm going to talk just briefly about sort of where does the rubber meet the road on these kinds of interventions. And I think Courtney's example is a really nice one. And in some ways, um, these types of interventions are what are really going to lead the field in terms of these technological interventions. Because this is one where she's taken a mechanism that we know from basic research, and she's found a way to target it and see that it can move. And then she's found a way to put it in clinical practice where it impacts symptoms. Um, so I think this is very very cool stuff, um, but one where I think we'll see some of the similar challenges to what we've seen with other interventions. So really two places where these kinds of interventions, I'm not very tall and I feel too tall for this, a um, couple places where these interventions can play a role. One is sort of as a standalone, dare I say, clinician replacer. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about why we don't have to worry about that, but also as an adjunct or an integrated element, which I think is what we should all be thinking about in terms of how can we use these in our own practice. Um, so here's why we don't need to worry about the clinician replacer issue, is the vast majority of people in need of care don't get it. You know, these are actually international data. These data are getting a little bit old, but um, you see the U.S. there. So these are people with mild and moderate mental illness. Far fewer than half of the people in need of care get it. Now, if we take this pie, we're going to slice this up a little bit more. Less than a quarter get specialty mental health care. Less than a third get what's been defined in the research as minimally adequate care. No one in this room would agree with the definition of minimally adequate care. It's two to three sessions of psychotherapy is actually where it is. Um, I know we're, we're good. We're not that good. Um, and many people who are getting treatment are getting treatment that is not anywhere close to evidence-based. 
And by that I mean alternative and complementary medicine, not the good stuff, not the stuff that we know can make some difference, like exercise, meditation, and yoga. We're talking about just wacky stuff with absolutely no evidence base, and if anything, may even be iatrogenic for folks. So as we look at, you know, of, of the people who need it, the people who get it, the people who get decent treatment, there is a massive gap there. Um, Courtney alluded a little bit to the issues of how do we actually realize the potential of these interventions, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. When you give someone something to do and you say, go, go take this computer-based program, um, good luck, people don't do it. People don't come anywhere close to doing it. So that's, that's a big issue. Um, but what I want to spend most of my time talking about is how can we think of this as an adjunct or an integrated element to what we're already doing? And I think there, there are three places to put this in. And this first one I think is actually really under-considered. And this, this is one that I'd love to see us think about more is how do we address gaps in staff expertise or content, particularly around co-occurring disorders? I think this is a great place to plug in these kinds of interventions. So I think of what, where I spend most of my time in a substance use disorder treatment program, you know, there, there's certainly some anxiety expertise, but not a ton. We don't, that's, that's not what we do. More than half of our patients who come through have significant anxiety disorders. Can we take something like this and plug it in in a way where we can work with the existing staff? This takes t 10 minutes once a week. Is that typically the dosing? Every day, okay. Every day, once a week, whatever. Um, <laughs> but again, 10 minutes, you're talking about something that's, that's very minimal that you can plug in, and now we're taking a gap in expertise. We've actually been talking about taking some uh, computerized CBT programs for insomnia. Again, something our populations have a ton of issues with. Uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of expertise in CBT for insomnia. Can we add that as an adjunct and try to knock down some of these co-occurring disorders in our programs? Um, and Courtney talks a little bit more about these other two issues. Can we reinforce and extend existing gains? One thing I think we have to be careful with here, particularly when we talk about anxiety, is um, for anxiety we have two major evidence-based treatments. We have pharmacotherapies, we have behavior therapy. You know, but antidepressants for the most part, behavior therapy, roughly equivalent efficacy. Behavior therapy tends to do a little bit better, but in general, both are good. Both have different purported mechanisms of action. So everybody was excited. Okay, if these have two different mechanisms of action, we combine them, we should get a big doubling of effect. Has that happened? No. Um, if anything, you might do a little bit worse if you do both at the same time. So I think we always have to keep in mind that these treatments may interact in ways that we don't expect. And when we are talking about adding something new onto what we're already doing, really understanding what the implications of that are are pretty important. Um, the other piece, and Courtney didn't talk about this much, although I know she's doing some work in this area, is can we actually bridge people with these kinds of interventions? When someone's stepping down from a higher level of care to a lower level of care, when we're transitioning someone to a new provider or clinic, that's a time we worry a lot about people, where people tend to fall off the map, and can this be something that can sort of keep the ball rolling for folks as they move forward? So here, here are the challenges, and I think this is where, as I think about this stuff, when I walk out of a talk like this, I always feel really fired up. I'm thinking, this is great, and I want to, I want to be able to offer this to people, and then actually doing it is really hard. Um, I'm curious, how many people implement anything sort of technological as an adjunct to their treatment? Apps, computer-based programs, anything at all? Okay, sort of a small, I was not enthusiastic. Um, so a small and enthusiastic bunch. I hear, I hear this a lot from folks about, you know, mindfulness-based apps, um, in particular things like relaxation-based apps. and. There are a couple of issues to how we actually do this, including with, uh, I think, some of the more larger packages, like a CBT-based kind of program, is how do you access it? And there are two issues here. Where do people find it? Do you have to pay for it? And the biggest issues, I think this is something that actually our community can really contribute to, is how do people vet it? You know, there is a massive explosion of apps, computer-based programs that are out there. If anyone goes to the app store on their phone and, and looks up anxiety, I don't even know how many you would get at this point. And if you're a consumer with no background in mental health, you don't know what you're looking for, how do you know what's good, bad, or indifferent? There is, there's no good housekeeping seal. There's no consumer reports for this kind of thing. Um, and who should fill that gap, I think, is an interesting question. Can a place like McLean fill that gap? Here, here are some vetted, reviewed, gold-starred programs. If you're looking for something, here's something that's good. 
Um, is that a place for professional organizations like APA, um, ABCT? perhaps, um, but if, if you think about trying to search these things with a background in mental health, it's impossible. Try doing it without a background in mental health. So certainly access is going to be an issue. Courtney also alluded to this issue of sustainability. Much of this stuff has been NIH funded, which is great. NIH funds you, you do the research. Um, as it turns out, technology changes by the second. So the, the app or the computer program that you develop today could be unusable in a year. So how do we actually sustain these programs? How do we actually capitalize on what we know from uh, the IT world? You know, the computer game, you know, think of Angry Birds or whatever that thing is where people walk onto other people's lawns looking for things. People know what I'm talking about. Pokemon Go, thank you. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll just say get off my lawn. Um, is, uh, can we capitalize on some of those kinds of things? I, I, I can use an example. My baby sister, I was uh, hanging out with her over the weekend, and she said, oh, I have to check on Phyllis. I thought, what, who, who is Phyllis? What are you talking about? And she pulls up her phone. Phyllis is a plant on an app that, did you know which one I'm talking about? I see you nodding. It's, it's to keep you hydrated. So she, you, you can actually mark how much you drink and based on the size, and Phyllis dies if you don't drink enough. She named it Phyllis, doesn't have to be Phyllis, but poor Phyllis will die if she doesn't drink enough, and if she does, so she has healthy Phyllis, and she said, look how hydrated I am. But that, that's something that can we actually use those kinds of things to actually engage people in these tasks so that you don't have the issue of when people go home, they never open it up again. So how do we actually really leverage this to make this work? Um, I can tell you, in terms of this issue of, of engagement and adherence, um, when I was in grad school, our student health service uh, at Boston University said, we need more CBT. We don't have access. We don't have referrals. We said, hey, we, we, we can help connect you to something. Let us collect a little bit of data. We'll connect you to something. We got them the program for free. They were fired up. We were fired up. The students were fired up. Students came in and they said, this is great. I don't have to walk into behavioral health because you have to actually walk in and take a left and then all the other students see so you go into behavioral health. They said, I could do this at 3 o'clock in the morning in my underwear. This is awesome. You know, again, this is, this is really realizing the potential of how can this actually uh, expand access to care. How many sessions do you think people completed on average? Any guess? Two, two, actually whoever, whoever came with two, two is correct, yes. Um, two sessions on, and again, these were people with clinically significant depression and anxiety who were fired up to do this, they had support from their providers, and again, you go home and you have access to it all the time, I'll do it later, I'll do it tomorrow, and people don't actually access it. Um, so thinking about can these interventions be implemented outside of a clinic? Do we really need to, like Courtney was saying, bring people in, give them some kind of support around sitting them down, giving, an, giving them an appointment, or are there other things that we can actually build in to, to really realize the potential of these issues? Um, the one last thing I want to mention here before we open it up to questions um, is another access-related issue. So if you look at the barriers to access, why aren't people getting care? There are two main types. One are logistical barriers. Uh, transportation, money, insurance coverage, child care certainly being a big one. Um, but those actually don't seem to be really the drivers of poor access to care. The driver to poor access to care primarily is perceptual barriers. I don't think I need it. I don't think treatment's going to work. I don't even realize that I have an issue with mental illness. So I think as we're thinking about these kinds of things, and again, if we're looking to sort of push these out in a way that extends the kind of care that we give, particularly to the folks who can't access it, we really need to be thinking about that piece too. And to some extent, I think these kinds of interventions maybe even have the promise for doing that. This is, this is a process that's gone wrong in your brain. We're looking to correct it. Maybe that's a better sell. I think that's a question that we still need to answer. So I think lots of questions to answer, but this kind of stuff I think really can both extend our care within what we're doing and hopefully also maybe knock down some of those numbers of really abysmal numbers of people who are getting care, um, who are not getting care, who really need it. Um, and I've, I've left exactly five minutes. So any questions for either of us?
That was really fantastic from both of you. Uh, my question is actually for Courtney. Uh, given that the older population may be more entrenched in some of their interpretation biases, I was wondering if you had considered yet um, either extending the length of the training session and or extending the duration of the time where they're doing the intervention. Can, can you answer from the microphone? Because people on the live stream won't Oh, sorry, live stream people. I totally forgot about you. <laughs> um, so yes, I would think about that, um, like for that well-being finding where in the older group there was just nothing happening either way. But that other finding that was completely reversed where the control group seemed to benefit my older group makes me think perhaps just more of the same is not going to be helpful. Perhaps it needs to be different when it's more entrenched, or you know, and maybe both of those things. Um, but very briefly, I think what may have made the control group better for older people is that it was repeatedly pairing very neutral aspects of the situation with, so things that weren't related to the emotional interpretation. So it was very neutral rather than positive. And perhaps when you're so entrenched, we need to take baby steps so that don't, you don't react against it. And uh, you know what I'm saying? So, so yes, but then also maybe it needs to be different depending on where you're starting. I don't know. Courtney? Um, oh, hi. Um, I was just wondering, did you notice any sex differences in your data? Were there maybe even more uh, females in the older population? I didn't look at it by age, not, not generally though, no, in none of my studies have I seen strong sex differences, and they haven't really come out in the, in the larger reviews either, which is interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Um, that was excellent. Thank you both. Um, I realize you're still in the research and development, but is there a link or anything so that perhaps I could see the entirety of the program? Uh, yeah, so okay. the, the one I did at the BHP was just on you know, E-Prime, which is experimental software on a computer. Um, and the one for primary care is a website, but you need um, you know, a password and a log on because it's for the study. But my hope is that if I could make it into an app, then I could give it to everybody. So, um, but if you. you wanted to do something here, for example, to try to pilot it, get in touch with me. Okay, we can Thank try you. to do that. This is a question for Courtney. Could you give us a, another couple of examples of what the test was? How, how you actually asked the questions and decided if the people were uh, being affected? So, so how do I know their interpretation is changing or um, their, their symptoms? You had a, a sample question that you asked and you showed it on the screen. Could you review that? Sure. So is that the, the word sentence association task where you see embarrassing people laugh after something you said? That kind of thing? Sure. So it was more things like um, you don't get a job and it's like failure or you know bad economy or um, your friend doesn't call you back, busy, mad, some of the exa examples I showed at the beginning. Or for panic related things, it's like your heart starts racing, nervous, heart attack, things like that. Um, I'd be happy to share. I have hundreds of them now, so I can share them with anyone who's interested. Great. So I think that brings us to 1 o'clock. So thank you both very much.